Hello, I'm Professor Brian Boucher. Welcome back. This video will be the start of a three video sequence in which we're going to apply ratio analysis to the case of a growth company to see what we can learn about the company. So without further ado, let me turn it over to a narrator to give you the facts of the case. Plainview Technology manufactures iris scanning equipment for biometric identification. In 2009, Plainview lost its largest customer, a defense contractor, which accounted for half of its business. The customer transferred its business to a foreign competitor with lower labor costs. Plainview management responded by increasing automation. The company also built plants in California and South Carolina to be closer to its customers. Plainview expanded into serving customers in new industries, such as healthcare, financial institutions, and nuclear power. Plainview switched from high-volume standard products to smaller batch customized products. In 2010, Plainview adopted new 6G technology, which provides better results at lower manufacturing cost. The company has experienced explosive growth after surviving its crisis and has picked up greater following by analysts and investors. A new analyst has just a few hours to prepare before participating on a conference call with Plainview Technology Management. The only information available is financial statements and ratios. Based the ratios, what seems to be the secret to the company's turnaround? What questions would you ask management during the call? Before we jump in and look at the ratios, I always think it's a good idea to go through the financial statements and take a look to see if there's any trends that sort of jump out at us or seem unusual that we should keep in the back of our mind as we go through the analysis. So here is the asset side of the balance sheet for Plainview. What I'm going to do is put up the pause sign and recommend that you pause the video, take a few seconds or a minute to look over the balance sheet and see if there's anything that really jumps out at you and then resume the video and we'll talk about what you're seeing. It certainly appears that PP&D has grown substantially. There also is a huge jump in inventory and accounts receivable after 2009. Yes, but the whole company has gotten bigger. Look at total assets. Do you have a point that you are trying to make? Uh, yes, Dave, I, I do have a point. My point is that it's a good starting place to look at the balance sheet because there are some dramatic year-on-year -year changes in some of these accounts, as Eric noted with the accounts receivable and the inventory, and as Elizabeth noted with the PP&E. But you're right, Dave, in that it is hard to look at this because the overall company is growing so much. Later in the video, we'll come up with a technique that will help remove some of the effects of this growth and give us a better picture of what's going on. Here's the liability and stockholders equity side of the balance sheet. So again, pa please pause the video and take a look at and see what you see. Well, I would say that long-term debt and paid-in capital have grown tremendously. Hey, I wanted to go first this time. Accounts payable has grown similar to inventory and accounts receivable, but current liabilities are actually down in 2011. But, you are going to pop it and tell us again that the whole company is growing, and we can't learn anything until we remove the effects of growth, and yada yada yada. Uh, yes, that's, that is what I was going to say, that it's hard to analyze this without taking the effects of growth out. But we do notice some strange things, like current liabilities actually went down in the most recent year, even though the company grew substantially. So there are some things we learn by looking at this balance sheet. Next, we're going to look at the income statement. So here is the last three years of the income statement for Plainview. Uh, please pause the video and see what kind of trends uh, leap out at you. Well, it looks like... It looks like sales, gross profit, operating income, and net income are all growing stupendously. And yes, we will have to remove the effects of growth to understand this better, which we'll do later in the video. Next, we have the statement of cash flows. So here is the operating section showing you cash from operations. Pause the video and take a look at and see what jumps out at you.
Ladies first. Hmm, even though net income has been growing steadily, cash from operations is, for lack of a better term, quite squirrely. Squirrely? Is that some strange jargon for volatile? Look at those big negatives for inventory and accounts receivable. Yes, those negatives match the growth we saw on the balance sheet. Now I think we are getting somewhere. We are getting somewhere. We see a lot of volatility in cash flow, and we can see that a lot of it is driven by these big jumps in working capital, accounts receivable, and inventory that we saw earlier in the video. We're starting to get somewhere. The rest of the statement of cash flows is the investing and financing sections. And at the bottom are the supplemental disclosures for cash interest paid and cash taxes paid. So pause the video and take a look at this. Although lumpy, the capital expenditures, proceeds from borrowing, and common stock issued mirror the growth in PP&D, debt, and at equity on the balance sheet. Yeah, so from here we can see that the company is growing substantially through its capital expenditures. There aren't any acquisitions here, so it's all internal capex, and we know from the case that they built two new factories, and that they're financing this growth with both debt and equity. So we see big debt issuances, and we see a couple big equity issuances. So they're using both forms of financing to grow the company. Now that we've taken a look at all the financial statements, I want to talk about something called common size financial statements. As we talked about, it's really hard to spot trends in the financial statement when the whole company is growing tremendously. Basically, the growth in assets, the growth in sales, tends to be driving trends in almost all of the line items. What we really want to know is, are certain line items growing more or less than you would expect given the growth in assets or sales? So we're going to produce something called a common size balance sheet, which will express all the numbers as a percent of total assets. Or you could express them as a percent of total liabilities plus to total stockholders equity. And if you think you might get different answers from those two methods, then you probably want to go back to video one and start over. Because of course, assets equal liabilities plus stockholders equity. We're also going to have a common size income statement. We're going to express all the numbers on the income statement as a percent of sales. So as a percent of top line revenue, that's what we're going to use to detrend or take out the growth in all the line items. For the cash flow statement, we're not going to common size it. It's less susceptible to growth than the other statements, and it's sort of hard to figure out what would be a good basis on which to do the common sizing. So it's only the balance sheet and the income statement that we common size. Here's what the common size balance sheet looks like for Plainview. This is the asset side. So why don't you pause the video and see what looks different now that we've common sized. Even though PP&T was growing so much, this makes it look like it is shrinking. It is really inventory that is growing splendiferously. Yes, Elizabeth, nice catch. So it's inventory that seems to be really out of whack, really seems to be growing more than the rest of the company. And we saw some evidence that inventory is having a negative effect on our cash flow earlier. So we're going to want to make sure we understand what's going on with inventory much more detail as we go through the videos. Here is the liabilities and stockholders equity side of the common size balance sheet. So pause, take a look and see what's different. These numbers look much more, as Elizabeth would say, squirrely. The biggest trend is the increase in liabilities relative to equity. Yes, Eric, the big conclusion we would draw here is that things are squirrely on the liabilities and stockholders equity side. There's no clear trends. Seems like numbers are bouncing up and down. I guess the only trend that we did point out is that compared to 2009, by 2011, liabilities have grown a little bit relative to equity. So we're not as heavily dependent on equity financing anymore. We've taken on some more debt financing and other liabilities. And here is the common size income statement. Everything is divided by sales. So pause and take a look. Gross profit percentage has gotten bigger. 
But, isn't this a video on ratios? When are we going to start looking at ratios? Well, Dave, these technically are ratios because they're numbers divided by sales. One number divided by another is a ratio. But you picked up the key thing here that there's a clear trend in an increase in gross profit margin. And that increase in gross margin has driven the increase in operating income and net income over the past three years. We're going to want to look into this further. And finally, we have the DuPont analysis. So here are the here is the return on equity for Plainview, and then it return on equity broken down into its components. All of the definitions of the ratios are at the bottom of the slide to remind you how we got them. So why don't you pause the video and take a look at these and see what kind of conclusions you draw from the DuPont analysis. So I'll go ahead and pop in here and analyze this one. So for return on equity, we see a pretty large and increasing trend in ROE over the three years, going from 11% in 2009, which means that each dollar of equity would return about 11 cents of net income, to 16% in 2011. So now each dollar of equity is giving you 16 cents of net income. So we're getting an extra nickel in net income for each dollar in stockholders' equity, which is a pretty big increase over a three-year period. Then we can look at ROA and financial leverage. So is this driven by operating performance or by taking on more debt? We see this a similar increasing trend in ROA from 7% in 2009 to almost 10% in 2011. So each dollar of assets is giving us an extra three cents of delevered net income over this period. Whereas financial leverage has been fairly flat, so it's not the case that Plainview has just taken on a lot of debt to increase its ROE. It's really increasing its operating performance. Then we can drill down into return on assets, and we see an increasing trend in profitability. So sales, each dollar of sales used to bring in about a nickel of, of net income. Now it's up to over seven cents. So our sales have become more profitable. Asset turnover went up briefly and then came back down, but there's not a clear trend here. So it looks like from the DuPont analysis that the sole driver of the increase in ROE is that our sales have become more profitable, our return on sales has gone up over the period. You said last video that ROE equals ROA times financial leverage. In 2011, 9.68 times 2.28 is 22.1, not 16.4. Just another in a long line of your mistakes. Uh, this one's not actually a mistake. It's a simplification. So remember from the last video that the return and return on equity is net income. The return and return on assets is delevered net income. So we add back the after-tax interest expense. So because we're using different returns, they won't multiply together. To get it to work, you'd have to put in a third factor, a correction factor, which would be net income divided by delevered net income. If you put in that factor, then everything would multiply together. Didn't the narrator say earlier that Plainview adopted new 6G technology? Maybe every company in the industry had better profitability as a result of the new technology. Excellent point, Elizabeth. We had mentioned in the first video how we need to do cross-sectional comparisons, compare Plainview to other companies in the same industry. So what I'll do next is compare them to three of their closest competitors. If you look at the industry, it looks like Plainview is having atypical success. They're doing better than these other three competitors. So they're the only company that had return on equity increase over these three years. Uh, two companies were down slightly. One was down dramatically. They had a steady increase in return on assets. Two companies were down. One was up and down. Return on sales for Plainview was steadily up. Again, for the other companies, they were flat or down. And then asset turnover for all companies was, was sort of up and down. But it, but it looks like whatever Plainview is doing with its ROE, ROA, and ROS it's not just an industry phenomenon, but it's doing something different than its competitors. So to wrap up, what we learned from the DuPont analysis is that the big increases in return on equity were unique for the industry. So Plainview was clearly doing something that the rest of the industry was not able to do. Plainview's improved ROA was the source of its increase in ROE. 
It didn't improve through just levering up, borrowing more money, but it's actually operating the company more efficiently. The ultimate source of the ROE and ROA increase was improvement in profit margin and return on sales. In contrast to its competitors, Plainview's return on sales grew dramatically. Asset turnover, in, in contrast, was fairly flat, similar to the rest of its competitors. So the whole secret to Plainview success was that their sales became more profitable between 2009 and 2011. Okay, but how were they able to make their sales more profitable? Can ratio analysis tell us that? Well, I do have a few more ratios up my sleeve, and we're going to take a look at those in the next video. Yeah, so we'll wrap up here, and I will see you next video where we'll continue looking at ratio analysis for Plainview technology. I'll see you then. See you next video.